Hi there, Smart Drivers, talking to you tonight about situational awareness. Where are you on the roadway? What kind of a roadway is it? Are you on an interstate? Are you in a residential area, multi-lane highway? Those types of things. What are the traffic signs along that roadway that are going to give you information and allow you to predict the traffic patterns that are going to happen? Situational awareness. We're talking about situational awareness tonight and helping you to be safer, smarter, understand where you are, observation, putting uh, defensive driving skills in place that are going to keep you safe when you're driving. If you're new to Smart Drive Test, my name is Rick August. I was a truck driver during the 1990s hauling freight between Ontario, Canada and the Eastern Seaboard in the US. Uh, mostly east of the Mississippi, did make it out to the Western states, uh, California, Oregon, uh, Idaho, Montana, all those states, but uh, mostly east of the Mississippi. Well, I was going to university in Melbourne during the early 2000s. I drove bus for Greyhound uh, while I was doing my doctorate degree uh, in uh, legal history, which is a study of policing, courts, and prisons. My expertise is in policing as it relates to traffic, oddly enough. 2015, I started the YouTube channel. The YouTube channel has been wildly more successful than I could have imagined. Uh, we just surpassed 48 million views on the channel, which is just an incredible number. Uh, if you want to know more about me, you can check out the autobiography over at the Smart Drive Test website, and Corey will put that up for you. Have a look at that. Good stuff to have a look at. Uh, five defensive strategies for the highway. There's also other uh, great defensive driving videos in that playlist. Have a look at that. And uh, five highway driving tips, uh, pardon me, uh, podcast over at the Smart Drive Test website. You can have a look at the podcast as well. And we're in the transition right now between moving those podcasts over here on to YouTube. So have a look at those. All right, so barbecues and swimming, what's the things that are going to hurt us? And this is one of the challenges of traffic safety authorities is to get across to young drivers that they are at the highest risk of being involved in a crash. And I can talk to you about some of this with some of the polls that I've run recently here on the YouTube channel and some of the misconceptions and ideas that people and drivers believe, which are erroneous, which means they're wrong, <laughs> okay? So swimming, we often think that swimming isn't dangerous and those types of things. And of course we put swimming uh, fences around swimming pools and those types of things because here in Canada, approximately 50 children a year drown in swimming pools. Uh, in the United States, it's probably 10 times that number, approximately 500. Uh, barbecues, uh, we don't really think of kitchen cupboards and barbecues as being dangerous, but they do catch on fire and, uh, you know, burn us and those types of things. So know that there are things that have a high danger risk uh, that we are susceptible to getting hurt, injured, and killed. We are very at risk of being injured and killed in a car crash, but most of us don't think of it that way. We are more afraid of tornadoes driving in the winter time or being eaten by uh, great white sharks. But for most of us, being eaten by a great white shark is simply not a reality because never in our lifetime are we gonna swim in shark infested waters. And even if we do swim in shark infested waters, we're probably not gonna be get beaten by eaten by a shark. Okay, so priorities when driving. When do you need to pay attention? There are times that you need to pay attention. There are congestion, summertime, two lane highways, intersections, those types of things. Do we manage space effectively around our vehicle? We can always control space in front of a vehicle. And there are many, 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 many drivers who believe that if you leave one ounce of space in front of your vehicle, that somebody is gonna creep in there and somebody's gonna take that space. That is a myth of driving that so many people believe. And so many people participate in social driving. They follow too close, they speed, they don't stop at uh, stop sign intersections, they drive over painted islands and yada, 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 yada. On and on and on about social driving. Social driving is the problem that you face when driving and it's the misconceptions about driving that winter time and snow and ice are when you were gonna die a horrible, terrible death by sliding off the road, crashing into a tree and dying in a fiery inferno. Nothing is farther from the truth. You are actually safer driving in the winter time than you are in the summertime. Most crashes happen in the summertime on two lane highways, 
in good moderate weather conditions okay and it's not <laughs> two cars crashing into each other two vehicles crashing into each other it's single vehicle crashes almost half of all fatal crashes in the summertime are single vehicle crashes of people one driver driving off the roadway okay what is traffic and what's the road that you're on do i need common calm awareness or do i need to go to yellow alert or do i need to go to red alert do i need to be more aware of what's going on in my driving environment social driving space management observation speed management and communication these are the smarter defensive driving model social driving is the problem that you face i find with most defensive driving models that they do not define the problem of driving they don't tell you what you're up against what you're trying to overcome and whatnot and you're going to find out that when you start going for your driver's license and you're driving the speed limit doing all the turns and all of this managing space and whatnot everybody else is doing something different to what you're doing okay space management if you can have space in front of your vehicle that three to four second following distance and you can always stop in traffic so that you can see the tires of the vehicle in front of you making clear contact with the pavement approximately one vehicle length you're going to be a safer smarter driver implement those two techniques and you will significantly reduce your chances of being involved in a crash all right mapping intersections and tracking road users 40 percent of crashes happen at intersections know that map and track road users where are the road users where am i going to intersect with the road users at the intersection intersections are also the place where you're most likely to cross paths with vulnerable road users pedestrians cyclists kids on e-scooters uh, skateboards wheelchairs people with mobility devices those types of things these people are you're going to encounter them at intersections be alert to the intersections be alert to people coming out and never trust that a person at an intersection is actually in fact going to stop and not cross your path travel where am i am i sitting in traffic am i driving on a highway and passing other cars uh who's coming up behind me how fast are they coming up behind me do i need to move over and those types of things learn to determine gap and left turns at intersections and one of the polls i put up this weekend i asked new drivers what was the most difficult maneuver they had to learn and for most of them they said slow speed maneuvers they did not say left hand turns however for most new drivers if you get into a crash very high percentages i would argue that 60 to 70 percent of them are misjudging the gap on a left hand turn and they get crashed into so left hand turns pay attention to those different environments are going to require different levels of situational awareness however the golden rule of driving always 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 manage space in front of your vehicle experiential where to focus the more experience you get the better you're going to be able to recognize potential hazards that could cause a crash okay develop habits that you will project you continue to shoulder check shoulder check shoulder check every time you change directions of the vehicle not shoulder checking is to driving what not checking to see if a weapon is loaded is to gun safety you, you would never ever pick up a weapon and not check to see if it was loaded and if you don't think that that's important simply ask alec baldwin uh, why that's important all right so why would you move a 2500 pound vehicle at minimum because vehicles weigh anywhere from 2500 pounds to 4000 pounds at speed and not look in your blind areas to see if there's a vulnerable road user there communicate and observe and before you move your vehicle or change directions make sure that you have minimum three flashes on the signal okay develop habits that will protect you new drivers the kind of i'm talking about i'm not talking about new drivers who are 25 plus i'm talking about new drivers in kind of that 16 to 24 year old category that are now experiencing for the very first time drinking dating distractions <laughs> and driving all of these are new experiences in your life that you have to deal with at the same time okay communication and observation and then i asked a poll here this was probably a couple of years ago now but why are new drivers most likely at, at risk of having a crash and most people said lack of experience when driving and i would add on to that moreover that young drivers simply don't have 
the experience to understand what is a potential hazard on the roadway, what potentially could hurt them, okay? Somebody moving into their path of travel and preparing and having it out for that to happen. So good luck on your driver's test. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. And Irvin, yes, thank you. Yes, definitely making your driving examiner scream during the test. Uh, that could potentially cause you to fail. However, uh, saying that I did have a driving examiner scream during my class one driver's test because went around the corner and the door opened up. <laughs> the driving examiner was kind of hanging out the door, uh, but I didn't fail my driver's test. I still passed the driver's test. Uh, Sean is here, Bricks for Wheels. Corey is the moderator, uh, does an excellent job of getting up the videos I suggest you have a look at. Uh, Francesca is here, uh, elevator fan outside of Chicago, uh, driving back home from O'Hare International Airport, one of the bigger uh, international airports there in the United States, uh, O'Hare and Chicago. Uh, Lynn is here, explore, pass my driver's test, uh, class five today, try, uh, thanks for your guidance and videos is uh, really best part. Thank you so much for dropping back and letting us know uh, that you passed your driver's test. Awesome, my friend. Uh, rain sounds, driving instructor unprofessional is a red flag, right? Uh, not sure, maybe uh, rain rephrase that because I'm not quite sure what you're asking me there. Jay is here, hello my friend. Uh, X and uh, yes, elevator says his mom is driving. That's great that you're not distracted driving, watching me live stream <laughs> while you're going down the road. Awesome. Uh, and Lynn is turning in from uh, northern New Jersey. Uh, excellent. And my friend Marion is here. We could talk about your comment that you left, Marion. I was talking, I was, uh, I did see it. So, uh, Pierce, what's the examiner during the driving test? Uh, Pierce, the driving examiner is the person that works for the test center. They work for the DMV or other testing authority, and they are the gatekeepers. They are the people that determine whether you pass or fail your driver's test. The driving examiner, your job is to demonstrate that you have due care and control of the vehicle in changing traffic conditions. Your job is to take away his or her right to fail you. Nothing less, nothing more. So that's what you need to do. That's who the driving examiner is. Uh, Queen failed today because of parallel parking and sorry about that. That's uh, unfortunate. Uh, you were simply unsuccessful. You're gonna practice uh, the uh, skills and techniques, uh, the feedback the driving examiner gave you, and next time you're gonna be successful on passing a, your driver's test. Uh, Evan, don't be too calm. Uh, you won't be prepared to pro, pro, proact to what's going on. I know that you said that you need calm awareness, but you need an intermediate between those. No, calm awareness is, is that you're not freaking out. What I mean by that, uh, Evan, is, is that you're calm, you're not freaking out, and but you're aware of everything that's what's going on around you and that's what i'm talking about today in terms of situational awareness uh you don't need to be on yellow alert now if a potential hazard presents itself then you go to the next level where you're at yellow alert you're covering the brake you're prepared for evasive action you've managed space well around your vehicle and you have some place to drive into you don't need to be this kind of driving all the time as proponents of distracted driving would like you to be. <laughs> so know that, that, you know, everybody who does distracted driving, and I get comments on my videos all the time that, oh my God, you're making a video and driving and we're all going to die kind of thing. And you need to be paying attention 24 uh, seven, every second, every minute when you're driving, you simply cannot do that when you're driving. We, we are distracted by all kinds of things that are going on uh, when we're driving. So, it's not possible to be completely 110% focused every time that you're dry, every moment when you're driving. So know that, uh, that you have to have this kind of calm awareness. You know where you are, you know what's going on, you've mapped and tracked the vehicles and road users around you and you've managed space well. You have calm awareness and you've created a situation that keeps you safe. You're re you're responding to what's going on. You're not reacting to what's going on in your driving environment. Uh, Lynn, I'm finding that driving examiners at one particular DMV near where I live are very inconsistent. I was told that I can talk to a supervisor on site. Have you ever had to do this? Uh, Lynn, driving examiners are rarely 
reprimanded for what they do in the vehicles. You can go and talk to a driving, uh, one of the supervisors. My counsel to you is to simply take your time and your energy and invest it in passing your driver's test, invest it in becoming a better driver. I know that it sucks. I know that there are some driving instructors or, or some driving examiners rather that are not nice. They are not fair. They are miserable, but there isn't a whole lot that you're going to do. And the supervisor is not really going to take a lot of what you say. You need to invest your time and energy into getting your, the skills and abilities you need to pass your license. So in terms of launching a complaint against the driving examiner, it usually doesn't go anywhere. So you've spent a lot of time and a lot of energy and you've got yourself worked up about the whole thing and you're not focusing on the task of what you need to do. And this, I'm not just giving you this advice because uh, I'm, you know, I don't want you to, uh, oh, okay, you're a driving instructor. <laughs> I, I don't know. It, de it depends whether you want to fight with the, these examiners. Because the thing is, Lynn, if you're a driving instructor and you have to work at this DMV, you have to go back with these people all the time. And this is one of the things that I said in 11 tips for driving instructors is, is that you have to work with these examiners. The students are going to come and go. However, uh, the you're going to be there all the time. The students are going to come and go, but you're going to be there all the time. So you need to work with these driving examiners. And what I would suggest to you is, you know, have a chat with them, kind of get, you know, have banter with them and those types of things. The, the piece about it is that driving examiners are going to be inconsistent. Okay, they're not consistent across the board. I, I could tell you exactly uh, that we had four different driving examiners here in the town that I live in. I could tell you exactly which traits every driving examiner had. We had one that was ex-military, and if he had students that showed up with tats and with you know a mullet and, and piercings, uh, the student was going to have a hard time, and it was 50-50 on whether he or she was going to pass. OK, uh, we had another guy that his thing was crossing over the white lines. OK, and uh, cross changing lanes over solid white lines. That was his or her thing. OK, and then the other person, it was dependent on what they had for breakfast. <laughs> so they are going to be inconsistent. And this is the piece, Lynn, uh, that you got to keep in mind. You have to teach your students to the point where they can pass with any one of the driving examiners. That's what you need to do. So you need to be tough on your students and bring them up to a level where they're going to pass with any one of the instructors. And I, I don't know what, or, or any one of the examiners rather. I, I don't know why we had this at the driving school once. We had one of the examiners that was working as an instructor and he was telling students, oh, you don't have to do that. and You don't have to do this, blah, blah, blah. And then the student was working with me again and they're like, oh, John said that I didn't have to do this. And I said, yeah, that's fine if you have John as your driving examiner. But there are three other driving examiners at the test center and you could have any one of those and i'm teaching you to pass with any driving examiner so this just not just for lynn this is for everybody you need to get your skills and abilities of driving to a level where you can pass with any driving examiner not just one driving examiner or another driving examiner or when everything goes swimmingly you need to get to a level where you can pass with any driving examiner, okay? Uh, Glear, I failed because there was a ball in the middle of my lane and there was a car parked at my right in oncoming traffic in the left lane. I passed close to the parked car to avoid crashing the ball. All right, uh, another unexpected event, something on the roadway, garbage, balls, those types of things. These are the types of things that you need to deal with in our unexpected events. And Corey will put up the video for you on unexpected events. Uh, this ties into big trucks and other things that are blocking the lane and whatnot. Glear, unfortunately, you made the wrong decision going near the parked cars to not hit the ball. Uh, you know, you, you kind of, it's, it's one of two things. You either run over the ball and keep in your lane, or you mirror signal shoulder check, change lanes, move into the next lane, and then move around the obstacle. And this is one of the things you're going to have to do. This is one of the things that I talk about in Driving Test Secrets, the ebook, which is currently free to download off Amazon. All we do is ask that you leave us a review, and we've got some great reviews on the book already. Uh, absolutely awesome, and I want to thank everyone, uh, Vanilla especially here, uh, for leaving a review on the book. 
that is really, really going to help us out to be able to get the book out there and help a lot of people <laughs> to pass their driver's test and to be safer, smarter drivers. So Corey, put up the link for that. Definitely have a look at that. Uh, Pierce, how can you be creative in driving opportunities? Uh, just take every opportunity you can to drive a vehicle, Pierce. Uh, if your uncle's going down to get a jug of milk at the convenience store, say, hey, can I go with you? Can I drive? That's what you need to do as much as you can. Uh, Mallory, hello from Nova Scotia. Yes, we said hello, Mallory. Uh, maybe you missed it at the beginning there, but uh, we were talking about the flooding that's going on and whatnot. But um, yeah, uh, so hopefully you're okay and everything's good. Uh, Marion, also don't rely on your Garmin GPS. It led me to 56 kilometers past where I was supposed to be going. Yes, <laughs> GPS, Google, all those things are not exactly reliable. GSD, hello from New Brunswick. Hello, hello, my friend. Uh, Daniel, thanks for uh, commitment to content. Rick, uh, it goes a huge way. Thank you so much for saying that. That is really awesome, my friend. Uh, Lynn, we are finding that most of our students need to do the K-turn from the parallel parking position. Uh, Lynn, okay, so just clarify that for me. So are they doing the parallel park along the curb and then doing their three-point turn? Is that what they're doing? Or are they getting them to pull in along the curb and then doing their K turn? Is that what they're getting them to do? Uh, just, just is it is it parallel park and then K turn all in one kind of series, or is it pull along the curb and then do the K turn? Uh, Corey's put up driving test secrets free to download. It's the ebook that I have written. I wrote it with two objectives: first, pass your driver's test. The first three chapters, automatic fails. Uh, reasons you'll be assigned to merit points and unexpected events on your driver's test. And then the other goal was to give you some skills and abilities to significantly reduce your chances of being involved in a crash. So pass your driver's test, defensive driving skills to keep you safe on the roadway. That was the purpose of the book. So have a look at that as well. I've made a video explaining it more, going through the chapters, explaining what uh, some of the parts are and give you a little tidbit. Uh, so I'll put that video up here probably tonight, early tomorrow morning, and you can have a look at that as well, and that will help you out. You can definitely download it and uh, have a look at that. Free download, leave us a review. We ask that you do leave us a review on the book. Thanks so much. Uh, Brian, I passed my road test. Thanks to your advice, man. It really helped. Thank you so much, Brian, for dropping back and letting us know that you passed your driver's test. Uh, what did you do to celebrate, my friend? Because that is an awesome achievement. You only passed your first driver's test once. So that's really, really great. Uh, Michael, if the driving examiner makes a small correction on a turn uh, you just made, does that make you failed? Like you could have done a little better? Uh, Michael, no. Okay, if, and this is the other piece about taking your driving test. Unless the driving examiner says to you, okay, we're going back to the test center and you've only been out two or three minutes, it's not likely that you failed your driver's test. If a driving examiner intervenes in your driving, and I mean, don't do that or takes control of the wheel or puts the transmission into neutral, that's an automatic fail in a driver's test. However, if they're just giving you some pointers, take those pointers on board because if they're saying, hey, uh, you need to shoulder check, they're kind of giving you a little hint that you know, your driving's okay, but you need to do this to be able to pass, okay? Because when I took my driver's test years and years ago, uh, I was so nervous when I started driving that I was just like, you know, I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't moving my head and the examiner just said, hey, you need to scan the intersections. And I was like, oh yeah, right, okay. And so sometimes they're just giving you a little hint to kind of help you out. Don't get stuck on the mistake. Okay, just keep going. And the other piece of that is, if you think you made a mistake, don't dwell on it. Okay, just take a breath and carry on. Okay, and the other piece is, Stryker's right down here by the desk. And when I can't breathe too deeply because he just farted. Frenchy farts. <laughs> so yes, so that's the great thing about, you know, having live stream that's 2D because you don't get the full effect of it, right? Anyway, uh, Marion, I did the parallel parking then straight into the Y turn. Okay, so you were still along the curb. Okay, so Lynn, yes, they are asked to do the parallel park and then asked to do the K turn. It's just the sequence. Okay, uh, Lynn, when you do the K turn, you have to pull along the curb anyway. So they're already at the curb. So uh, I'm not sure why you're seeing that as a problem. 
okay? Is it causing students problems? Because all you need to do is in your teaching is to just get them to do the parallel park and then go straight into the K-turn and just say to them, hey, this is what we do at the, at the, at the test center. Uh, you know the location where they do that. So you just work with the examiners. If that's what the examiners want, then that's what you give them, right? Uh, it was the same thing. Um, when I was teaching truck driving here and I moved to Vernon and I got hired by the truck driving school, there's a hill on the highway and we used to come up the, the back road along the lake and then we would pull out onto the highway. Well, you got brand new students who have no idea how to shift the truck going down a hill. And so I would get the students to pull out on the highway and turn their four-way flashers on because your four-way flashers is way safer when cars are bombing down the hill at 120K and some dumbass truck driver is doing like 40K. So the cars are doing 80 miles an hour and the truck is doing like 30 miles an hour. So there's a 50 mile an hour speed differential there. So I would get them to turn on their hazards to tell other traffic that they're going slow. So the student, my first student comes back from his driving test, he passed, but this, the examiner said to him, oh, you need to put your turn signal on. You need to put your turn signal on. And I'm like, are you people stupid? But <laughs> the examiner wants, the examiner gets. So after that, I just told my students, just put your signal on. Okay, even though it's 10 times safer to put your four way flashers on because when the cars are coming down the hill at 80 mile an hour and the truck's pulling out at 30 with a 50 mile an hour speed differential that the cars are going, hey, the truck has its four way flashers on. Maybe the truck is going slow. Okay, but the examiner wants, the examiner gets. So they got turn signals. Uh, Lynn, I don't like surprises, so I try to emulate the test as much as possible. Yes, awesome, awesome. That's what you got to do right? The examiner wants, the examiner gets. We teach to the test to a certain degree, right? Because we want our students to pass. There's nothing, I know, Lynn, I, I hear you. <laughs> there's, there's nothing worse than being in a vehicle and the student had failed. And let me tell you, uh, my one student, uh, we, we drove all the way to Penticton and then we had to sit in it for an hour coming back from Penticton to Kelowna in the truck because he didn't he wasn't successful on his driver's test and you just like sit in it because they're just like pissed off that they didn't pass their driver's test so yeah there we go <laughs> uh elevator saw big trucks not obey the sign that says no trucks left uh two lanes yes that happens uh don't say anything about it especially to truck drivers because they get really excited when you say that uh, 3PO, Rick, if 40% uh, of crashes happen in intersections, what, where, what's the other 60%? Uh, the other 60% is obviously not at intersections. It's the 60% of two lanes, fatal crashes, rural roads, uh, single vehicle crashes where they drive off the road, they roll the car, they hit a fixed object, those types of things. And uh, there was a statistic that came out of the United States that although... I'm trying to remember the numbers here, so don't quote me on this because I'm not looking at it right now. But although that, although 18% of Americans live in rural areas, 40%, so almost more than twice, of fatal crashes happen in rural areas. So 18% of Americans live in the country, 40% of crashes happen, 40% of fatal crashes happen in the country. Uh Green, uh, there was an accident ahead of me and I put my hazards on in order to notify the driver behind me. My husband and I didn't need to do that. I disagreed. Thoughts? Uh, Green, you know, you're right. Your husband is wrong. If, if there's no traffic behind you and you're coming to a stop on the highway for no apparent reason, yes, put your four-way flashes on to notify traffic behind you that you're at a stop so that you don't get rear-ended. As well, keep space in front of your vehicle that way, if you're looking in your center mirror and you're watching that traffic come up and it's coming up really crazy, just start moving up like nice and slow because vehicles that are moving are less likely to be rear-ended as opposed to vehicles that are completely stopped. So yes, put, put your four-way flashers on and then just nice and easy roll forward, keep that big space in front of you and keep an eye on your center mirror uh, so that you don't get rear-ended. So yes, absolutely. Uh, 3PO, you would think the rural areas are safer. No, they're not. They're really not. They're actually more, uh, more dangerous for driving. And there's a few reasons why they're more dangerous for driving. 
Uh, you're farther away from medical facilities, hospitals, and those types of things. So first of all, uh, you have to get medical attention. They have to get to you. And sometimes, you know, that helicopters and uh, medevac, that's not always readily available. So they have to get to you and then they have to get to the hospital. And uh, trauma surgery, they know with trauma surgery, this came out of the Vietnam War, that they have to get you. If you are, in, if you are critically injured, you have to be in surgery within 50 minutes. Okay, it's called the golden hour. You have one hour to get people into surgery. And if they're fatally injured, or not fatally injured, but critically injured in a traffic crash in a rural area, it's really tough to get people to the hospital and into surgery within that golden hour. So if you're in a critically injured in a car crash uh, in the countryside, it's really tough to get you into medical services. So they got to find you, they got to locate you, they got to get medical services to you, and they got to get you to the hospital. So uh, that's the one thing. The other thing about uh, country areas and those types of things, a lot of people are speeding, they're going far too fast for conditions of the roadway. Uh, and I would argue as well, Tim, I don't know whether Tim's still here or not, but uh, he would say this as well, that there are a lot of inebriated people driving their vehicles on country roads. They're high, they're drinking, uh, those types of things. So they shouldn't be drinking anyway. So know that. Uh, Pierce, is it absurd or absorbed in driving? You said in a minute ago. <laughs> no, you want to be aware of what's going on in when you're driving. You want to have 360 degree awareness around your vehicle. You want to keep that space in front of your vehicle and you want to have calm awareness when you're driving. Uh, Ray, when I was driving home from my dad's house, a car behind me drove beside me into the oncoming traffic just to get onto the left lane. It's crazy how people try to hurry enough to endanger others. Yes, they do all the time because it's me first. I got to get there first. Green animals are an issue as well. Yes, they are. Uh, you know, wildlife, moose, deer, Tasmanian devils, uh, wombats, <laughs> all those types of things out on the roadways, dogs and whatnot. And on that note of animals on the highway, uh, if it's a small animal, if it's a cat or a squirrel or a bunny or something like that, yes, I know that some of we, we love them and it's all nice and they're fuzzy and warm and those types of things, uh, run over them, okay? It is not worth your life hitting something that's small or trying to avoid it and careening off the road, losing control of your vehicle and those types of things. Now, bigger, moose, deer, bears, those types of things, uh, you got to try and reduce your speed as much as possible. And just before you hit it, make sure you let go of the brakes because when we brake the vehicle, the front of the vehicle nose is down, right? And what happens is if you hit a moose or a deer and the front end is nose down, what happens is they come up over the front hood and they come through the windshield. So if it's a bigger animal, just before you there's impact, if impact is imminent, let off the brakes, let the front end come back up, and that, in most cases, will avoid the animal coming over the hood and through the front windshield, because unfortunately, that's usually what kills people uh, in the vehicle uh, when they impact larger animals and whatnot. All right, uh, 3PO, yeah, I don't want to be a sh uh, skewered by antlers. Yes, there's that piece too. Uh, Ray, if I saw a kangaroo on the road, I would be scared if they broke out of a zoo. <laughs> not if you're in Australia, okay? If you're driving in Australia, and I have hit kangaroos in Australia. And the other piece is, I know that it is really tough. Uh, I hit uh, wallabies when I was in Australia. Wallabies aren't very big. They're three or four feet high. They're a meter tall. Uh, if you hit one, please stop and check and see if they're dead. Because if they're not dead, please don't let them suffer put them out of their misery. I know it's not the best thing and it's really, really a gross thing to do, but you can't let animals suffer. You do have to put them out of their misery. And if you can't do it, call the local sheriff. I know in some US states and counties and whatnot, you call the local sheriff, you hit an animal and they'll come out and check or they'll put it down or those types of things. So please just check and make sure it is in fact dead. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, Elevator, I saw truckers change lanes aggressively on Interstate 294. And yes, unfortunately, they're going to do that as well. Uh, could you explain uh, my question quickly? Uh, Marion, just remind me of the situation again. Uh, you were, there was 
two lanes, multi-lane. You were in this lane. There was a car coming out onto the highway on an on-ramp with an acceleration lane. And there was another vehicle here, so you couldn't move over. And there's a red light in front of you, and you braked. You hit the brakes to slow down for this vehicle here coming out on the uh, acceleration lane. Do I have that correct? Just remind me if I have that correct for sure. Uh, Pierce, how does calm awareness work? Uh, calm awareness is just that you're calm when you're driving. You're not super excited. Uh, you're just creating situation and space around your vehicle so that you can respond to what's going on in the traffic situation. So, for example, you're, you have that space in front of your vehicle and you're looking down the road, uh, you know that you didn't see the traffic light change, it's green, so you're coming up to the traffic light and you're prepared for the traffic light to turn yellow and that you're going to come to a stop. So, you know, you're maintaining that space, you're aware of the vehicles that are on this side, you're aware of the vehicles behind you, you've got space behind you, and you're coming up to that traffic light and boom, you get there and all of a sudden it turns yellow. But you can nail the brakes and get stopped for that yellow light because you know with your calm awareness that you were watching in behind you and know that the person behind you isn't like right on the back of your vehicle and they're not going to tailgate you when you hit the brakes to stop for the yellow light. Because keep in mind, and this goes for driving instructors and everyone else who's preparing for a driver's test right now, yellow lights. It's not the end of a green, it's the beginning of a red. So if you can come to a stop, come to a stop for the yellow light. All right, so what Marion said, she was on a multi-lane road. There's a car beside her here. She's here and somebody's coming out onto the on-ramp on the acceleration lane to merge onto the highway. And then in front of them, there's a red light. So what happened was, <laughs> you're not going to like this part, Marion. She, she failed to read the situation and she failed to protect the space around her vehicle. But this happens. We get caught out, right? We're not, we go into Lala land. And the reason we go into Lala land, I've talked about this before, Driving is spatial orientation. It's a vehicle here, it's a vehicle here, it's a vehicle here, how much space it is. Spatial orientation and figuring out where vehicles are in space and place is a right brain activity. Our right brain is not responsible for logical reasoning and artificial time. That's a, that's a left brain activity. So figuring out math, uh, figuring out artificial time, that's a left brain activity. Now, if you talk to people who draw, or other types of artists when they're working, they will tell you that they'll go into this kind of trance where they have no concept of time. And a couple of hours later, they'll lift their head up and go, oh my God, where did all that time go? That's a right brain activity. And that's what happens to us when we're driving. So I'm not saying, oh, Marion did it wrong. <laughs> what I'm saying is, is that we get into this right brain activity where it's, it's, mapping and tracking vehicles in space and place and then all of a sudden we forget about artificial time and we're like all of a sudden we wake up and we go oh wait a minute oh my god that car's right there so if you can marion what i would suggest is this vehicle that was behind you just get back behind this vehicle you did the right thing that you didn't speed up you you let off the brake and you had awareness that there wasn't somebody behind you so when you nailed the brake that somebody was going to tailgate you but you hit the brake and the person come out in front of you. We get caught out every now and again in these situations. But the other thing is, again, this comes back to the calm awareness. And it comes back to experience of driving in that you're coming up, you're like, oh, there's an intersection. Because an on-ramp and an acceleration lane onto an interstate or a freeway or a highway, that's, it. that's an intersection. I'm going to intersect with that vehicle that's coming out there. So you wanted to create a calm awareness where you're like, Okay, I'm looking over here. There's an intersection. There's somebody coming out. There's a car beside me, and I'm just going to let off the throttle because I've got lots of space in front of me. I'm just going to let that person come in front of me. And oh, look, hey, the, the light just went yellow. So we're going to come up to the stop sign as well. So you did the right thing. All right. Uh, Corey's put up with how to deal with yellow lights. Thank you for that, Corey. Uh, Jackson, I was uh, going close to a speed limit, like driving at the speed limit, and I was about to make a right turn. And the light turns red and I cross the solid white line near the stop sign. Okay, and that's the right thing to do, Jackson. If the light turns red, yellow to red, and you get caught out, sometimes you're not going to get stopped at the stop line. But it's better to stop and be a little bit in the crosswalk than it is to go and blow through a red light. And in the last couple of weeks, I'm not sure what's going on here, but I have seen people like blatantly 
low red lights. Like I can stand there at a yellow light at an intersection and I can hear cars coming and they'll be like 300 meters, 300 feet from the intersection. You can hear wah and the car accelerates to get through the yellow light, right? Uh, so it happens all the time, but I've seen people, seen drivers like blow right through a red light. Like, I mean, solid red. <laughs> <laughs> uh jackson should i slow down i'm about to enter a right turn uh jackson yes definitely slow down when you're making right turns my friend okay uh mary in, in all fairness the truck that came up into the acceleration lane but there were bushes on the side of the road as well as so i didn't see him coming okay perfect but um again marion when you see the acceleration lane, yes, there are trees and bushes there. You can still sometimes catch movement through those trees and bushes that will alert you to the fact that there's somebody coming out. And that's just a matter of experience. It's the same thing uh, when you're on a highway and you're going around a corner, like you are not a corner, you're going around a curve, right? You want to try and look through the trees to see if there's any movement in the trees of tr that's gonna alert you to traffic coming around the, the curve on the other side. There's always a bit of movement because our eyes are attracted to light and movement. And when a vehicle is moving through a curve or a corner on the other side of bushes and trees or some sort of obstruction that you can partially see through, see through a little bit, the light is going to change and the movement through the trees is also going to be able to be de detected by you as a driver. So this is one of the things that you want to be looking at. And the other piece about on ramps and acceleration lanes is they're not, the, what I'm trying to say is the road infrastructure changes to alert you to the fact that there's an on-ramp and an acceleration lane there. And when there's an on-ramp and an acceleration lane, you need to be on kind of yellow alert at that point. You need to go from calm awareness to yellow alert to say, hey, wait, there's a, an on-ramp there. There's an acceleration lane. Maybe there might be a vehicle coming through, especially if your view is obstructed. And <laughs> the other piece about that obstruction, uh, you know, we can go back to the crash with the, the Bronco bus right? Uh, the bus is going this way across the prairies. He looks up the highway on the crossroad and there's a truck coming and then there's a grove of trees there and the truck disappears between behind the grove of trees. And you're, and you know, as a driving instructor, as a professional uh, truck driver, as a crash investigator, my brain, if I'm in the vehicle going this way and this vehicle, because you can tell that the two vehicles are going like this and they're coming together at an intersection, my brain is going, where did that truck go? And I'm on, now I'm on high alert as I'm approaching the intersection because I'm like, where did that other vehicle go? Where did it go? Because if you can't see it anymore, something happened. It turned off, it stopped, pulled off the side of the road, or the sucker's still coming and it's gonna intersect your path of travel. So there's, there's always, a point in your driving where you're going to go from calm awareness to yellow alert to like, well, wait a second, something's going on here to red alert where you're like, where did that sucker go? <laughs> and I need to figure out where that person is before I proceed. And sometimes it's just get on the brakes and stop. And this is another piece. And I've seen this happen numerous times uh, where you're going down a multi-lane road and the traffic in this lane stops and you're like, wait a minute, what just happened? Because what's happened is, especially here in British Columbia, where we've got these weird, just like crosswalks at random places, a pedestrian is crossing the road this way, this lane of traffic stops, but they're blocking your vision to see the pedestrian in front of them on the other side. So if this lane of traffic is coming to a stop, that should be potential hazard in your brain that, wait a minute, they stopped. I need to stop and figure out what's going on here before I proceed. Because if you continue to proceed, you're going to run over uh, the pedestrian in the crosswalk. So know that. So if the hazard, the obstruction disappears, you're either on yellow alert or you're on full alert where you're coming to a stop and trying to figure out what's going on around you to keep yourself safe and other people in the traffic environment safe as well. Uh, Epic, if practicing for a road test, uh, should you try 
uh, drive over painted islands and to protect the left-hand turn lane or not from a residential road to a main road? Uh, no, if you're driving on a driver's test, the absolute rule epic is, is that you should not drive over painted islands. If there's a painted island and you're trying to get into that left turn lane and the traffic is backed up, you need to wait behind that traffic until you can get into that left turn lane. Most intersections, I'm not saying all intersections, but most intersections with a left-hand turn lane will have an, an advanced green. They'll have a protected left turn signal. And it's going to be safer for you to wait to get into that painted island uh, behind the other traffic and then move up and move into that turn lane uh, than rather than driving over the painted island. Uh, Pierce, does practice uh, require correction success without damages? One bump and one hits. Uh, uh, Pierce, not sure. Can you reword that for me? Don't understand what you're asking me there. Uh, Marion, you're most welcome, my friend. Uh, Ray, when I took my driver's test, my examiner loved that I was doing proper shoulder checks. Yes, they will. As I put up the question there a day or two ago, I think it was yesterday I put it up, about what is the most common mistake on driver's test. The most common mistake on driver's test is shoulder checking, shoulder checking, shoulder checking. All right, uh, let's get over here. I want to show you this. Uh, Amazon. I just want to show you this is the book, Driving Test Secrets. Uh, have a look at this. It's on offer, free to download. We simply ask that you leave us a review of the book here. Uh, here you'll find the hidden skills and abilities that will guarantee you pass your driver's test first time. Uh, we have eight ratings, five stars. Thank you everybody for this. Uh, we're also ranked first in parent participation in education and in mass transit. So eight ratings. Thank you so much. Uh, Eric left a comment. Book was great in detail and simple to understand. It takes the what seems to be the harder aspect of driving. It explains them and breaks. I didn't transition this. <laughs> there you go. Now you can see it. I'm, more, I'm getting better at this technical bit. Uh, it takes what seems to be harder aspects of driving, explains them, breaks them down, and helps you understand. Great book. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Vanilla88, thank you for the review. Thank you, Dr. Rick. You are truly a godsend. Uh, this book is informative and filled with tips and guidelines on how to be a defensive driver. Thank you for that review. Very, very awesome. Uh, great book. Uh, Debbie, full of so much information to help you pass your CDL. Get it today. You will not regret it. Thank you so much for that, Debbie. Uh, and Amna, thank you so much for this. Uh, good luck, everyone. Good, good driving book. Uh, KS, very informative and uh, Nan, well done. Uh, Rick August has taken a very serious topic and presented it with just enough levity to lessen the tension, but still keep it real. Uh, levity is I did add a bit of humor into the book to try and, you know, just <laughs> ease the tension a bit. Uh, as a licensed driving instructor in Ohio, I know how difficult it can be to some, uh, can sometimes be to get teens to accept that car crashes are the number one cause of death while understanding that risk can be managed. Uh, Rick explains how to keep safe while traversing the insanities of other drivers. Thanks for a great book. So thank you so much for those great reviews. Uh, have a look at the book. Uh, spent a lot of time, a lot of energy on it. Uh, and uh, as I said, hoping to achieve the goals of helping you pass your driver's test first time and making you a safer, smarter driver by giving you skills and abilities uh, to be a defensive driver and keep yourself safe and it's not defensive it's to be a proactive driver that's what i want to do create situations in your driving environment so that you respond to what's going on not react because if you're reacting you're giving up your control of your vehicle you're hoping on a wing and a prayer that you can react in time to what other people are doing to keep yourself safe and that doesn't always work we want to be proactive that's what we want to do so there's the book free download until Thursday, we ask that you simply leave us a comment on the book and uh, that will definitely help us out and help other people out uh, to be safe on the roadways. Uh, Tim, uh, did I make many changes? No, not many changes, Tim, uh, because uh, some of the changes uh, that you pointed out, mostly I'm looking for an American audience and most of the uh, changes that you pointed out are simply here in the States in, in Canada. But uh, thank you again for your feedback. Greatly appreciated, my friend. Uh, Hannah, I have a question. How do I maintain speed when driving on the road? I consistently have to look at my speedometer and I feel like it's not safe. 
Uh, Hannah, you don't have to, 10 to 15 seconds, you should be looking at your speedometer as part of your forward scanning pattern when you're driving. Uh, so, you know, basically you just need to try and drive the posted speed limit, but you know, you do need to be checking your speedometer as part of that forward scanning pattern. Far down the road, in instrument panel, far down the road, center mirror, far down the road, wing mirrors, down the road instrument panel and then repeating that as part of your forward scanning pattern when you're driving. Uh, Pierce, should I make my driving practice perfect? What I'm telling you, Rick, uh, no, Pierce, what you should be doing is practicing enough so that you can pass your driver's test. You have the rest of your driving career to, uh, to perfect your driving, okay? We wanna get your driver's license so that you can get on with your driving and be a better safer smarter driver all right uh ray i can thank rick for providing the resources on youtube for me to pass my driving test in may awesome thank you so much for that ray that is awesome so glad that we could help out and uh excellent thank you tim uh happy to help and uh tim we were talking about rural crashes before i don't know whether you were here or not we were talking about rural crashes and why there are more fatal crashes in the United States. The, the statistic that came out the other day on Twitter, which is now X, <laughs> and when you make tweets, they're not tweets anymore, they're now X's. All my X's live in Texas. I don't know. It, 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 it's Anyway, it's Twitter. He paid $44 billion for it. He can do what he wants, right? Uh, so we were talking about rural crashes and we were talking about that 18% of Americans live in the country, but 40% of fatal crashes happen in the, in the country. The, what I was asking, Tim, uh, would you say that drunk driving and driving high have a lot, have are contributing factors to more fatal crashes in the country? Excellent. Um, Does the BMV do walk-ins for the driving test? Uh, no, they don't. Uh, you have to book your driving test. You're on road driving test. If you're doing the, um, <laughs> if you're doing the written part, yes, I believe that is walk-ins for that, but you would need to check that on the DMV website. Okay, Jackson, I'm about to make a right turn. Uh, the light is green and I was getting close to the solid white line behind the stop sign and the light was green, but as soon as it was close to the solid white line, uh, no, you don't have to come to a complete stop, my friend. You just have to slow down. It's approximately 10 to 12 miles an hour, but that's just a general rule, but you do have to slow down for your right-hand turn. Jocelyn, yes, it is available Amazon US, my friend. So definitely click the link and get it, pick it up there in Amazon US for sure. Uh, Jackson, light turned red and I didn't stop behind the line, the white line. Okay, uh, Jackson, that's okay. If you get caught out, as sometimes we will, as long as you come to a stop before you enter the intersection. So the stop line, so if you're looking at the edge of the intersection where the curb is on the cross street, there's the sidewalk, which is here, and then the stop line is back here. As long as you stop before you enter the intersection, you're going to be just fine. Because sometimes we get caught out on those yellow lights, okay? But as long as you stop before you enter the intersection, you're going to be okay, all right? Uh, Damon also helps to know well how your vehicle power plant sounds when it's idling versus accelerating for the purposes of speed control. Yes, it does. Uh, however, Damon, I mean, that's just a matter of getting used to the vehicle that you're driving. And that's a good point that you made. Yes, as you're practicing at the beginning of your driving lessons, yes, get in some different vehicles and those types of things. But in the days and hours leading up to your driving test, stay in the same vehicle. Okay, don't move around between different vehicles. And definitely on test day, don't try and get in a different vehicle and go down and do your driver's test. Because as you said, they respond differently, they feel differently, they accelerate differently, the engine sounds differently and all those types of things. So when you take your driver's test, stay in the same vehicle uh, to have the best chance of success when you pass your driver's test. Uh, Muhammad, how should I turn the steering wheel uh, doing the maneuverability test? Uh, for the maneuverability test, Muhammad, you can use one hand on the steering wheel. So one hand on the steering wheel, the other hand behind the passenger seat. And uh, Corey, I'll put up the video for you on the maneuverability test, and that will help you there in the Buckeye to pass that and be successful. Uh, Epic, 
In the western parts of the United States, you will have drivers that age 14 to 15 years old having driver's license and higher speed limits. In other parts of the U.S., like New Jersey, uh, New York, Pennsylvania, the age is 16 to 18 years old. Yes, so in some states, some of the western states, definitely a younger age for getting your driver's license, which I think is better personally because then you can get your driver's license and then you can deal with the drinking issue and the distraction issue of phones and other technologies and those types of things and then the dating issue right because there's the four d's which you're dealing with all at the same time which is contributing to new drivers getting in higher crash rates all right uh pierce maneuver requires two hands for beginners uh pierce i don't think that you're in the state of ohio only those in the state of ohio have to do the ohio maneuverability test so if you're not in the state of ohio don't worry about it uh, Mallory, do you have to show to check on a sharp turn in the roads? Uh, shoulder check. No, you don't have to do shoulder checks. However, Mallory saying that every time you change directions of the vehicle. So for example, here where I live, if you go up to the ski hill, we have switchbacks, right? Which are 180 degree turns because the mountain, the road, the mountain is too steep to have the mount. We say that the mountain is too steep for the road to go straight up the mountain so what they do is they go up and they switch back and then they switch back okay so you're basically going around 180 degree curve when you're going around 180 degree curve you're going to look up the mountain to make sure that there isn't anybody deviating into your lane so you're going to shoulder check up the mountain to keep yourself safe okay so saying that backing up what i was saying yes on sharp curves uh you're going to look around the curve but to keep yourself safe all right okay great live stream very busy thank you so much uh download driving test secrets over at amazon us and canada it's, it's available write us a review leave us a review for the book that really helps us out that helps us to get it out to other people and keep them safe and yes there are some humorous bits in it <coughs> excuse me so have a look at that all right frenchy time and yes Frenchy Striker is farting down here at the edge of my desk because it's kind of wherever I go. If I'm working at my desk, he's laying right down here at the bottom of the desk. So come here. You. Hello. Your fans want to see you. There you go. Oop. Hang on. There you go. Can you see? Can you see? No? You're okay. I woke him up for a nap, so he's not very happy. <laughs> all right you're okay there you go no you don't want to see your fans you're like dad just leave me alone and it was sleeping so well <laughs> all right <laughs> 3po uh, when the dog farts in the car it definitely encourages social driving yes that's uh that's that's it uh for those of you who haven't met this is striker okay he's the smart dog here yes belly rub Billy Rub, hi. It doesn't work as well on him as it does on females uh, with Izzy Bear. So, yeah. There's Striker. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for all your great questions. Have an awesome night. If you passed your driver's test in the last couple of weeks, congratulations. That is absolutely awesome. If you have a driver's test coming up in the next week or so, good luck on that. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great night. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Ha, ha, ha.